What's up, Wisecrack? Jared again. If there's one thing people know about Quentin Tarantino outside his proclivity for foul language and violence, it's his profound love for cinema. This obsession with film is littered throughout his work, with entire movies that function as homages to spaghetti westerns, classic kung fu, and black exploitation. And of course, his newest film is set in 1960s Hollywood. Now, while these films may implicitly celebrate the medium that's so dear to his heart, it's in his Nazi killing classic Inglorious Bastards that we see his most significant statement on the power of film, a statement that today may no longer ring true. So let's figure out why in this Wisecrack edition on Inglorious Bastards. And of course, spoilers ahead. All right, guys, first, a quick recap. Inglorious Bastard starts with the Jew hunter Hans Landa pursuing his victims in the French countryside. He's able to suss out the Dreyfus family, but one young woman, Shoshana, narrowly escapes. Shoshana! Meanwhile, a select group of American Jews known as the Bastards, led by Lieutenant Aldo Rain, are waging a guerrilla war in Nazi territory and collecting as many Nazi scalps as possible. Each and every man under my command owes me 100 Nazi scalps. The Bastards set off to infiltrate the premiere of Joseph Goebbels' newest piece of propaganda, Nation's Pride, a screening which will be attended by the entire Nazi high command. Also, this cinema happens to be run by none other than Shoshana, who plans to burn the place down on premiere night. Both plans more or less work out, and the leaders of the Third Reich are butchered in a blaze of flames and a hail of bullets. It rules. While all this is happening, Landa captures Aldo and negotiates his defection. But as soon as Landa crosses into Allied territory, Rain kills his escort and leaves Landa a little something to remember him by. I think this just might be my masterpiece. Even in that summary, the role of film is pretty clear. The climactic events of the story are centered around a film screening. But even before the screening, the bastards meet a German actress, Bridget von Hammersmark. People throughout the movie reference specific German films, like The White Hell of Pitts Palou and filmmakers like G.W. Pabst. Mais vous admirez le réalisateur Pabst? C'est pour ça que vous avez mis son nom sur le ponton. As scholar Susan Suleiman notes, even the title is an intentional misspelling of Enzo Castellari's 1978 film, The Inglorious Bastards. Tarantino, quote, changed the spelling to acknowledge both his debt and his difference to the film. But beyond including references to film, which is not exactly novel for Tarantino, Inglorious Bastards is meta-cinematic. In other words, it's a film about film. The whole plot ends up being framed not just around the nation's pride premiere, but the broader German culture of film. Goebbels considers the films he's making to be the beginning of a new era in German cinema, an alternative to what he considers the Jewish-German intellectual cinema of the 20s and the Jewish-controlled dogma of Hollywood. It's no mistake that Goebbels, the propaganda minister, is prominent throughout. Historically, the Nazi party had several mediums for propaganda at their disposal, but they heavily exploited the power of cinema. Even today, propaganda films like Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will are appreciated for their technical prowess, but condemned for their disturbing ability to deify Hitler. The Nazi propaganda machine created a lot of modern filmmaking, but also showed the danger of its powers in the wrong hands. With Inglorious Bastards, Tarantino suggests that just as cinema built the Nazis up, so too can it tear them down. In making a film that relishes in the highly stylized murder of the Nazi regime, Tarantino wields the same power once wielded by Goebbels, except this time with the opposite message. Bastards goes to great lengths to establish that in its universe, the camera is more powerful than the sword. Their contact in Germany is a British agent chosen for his cinema expertise. And I've had two books published. Impressive. Well, don't be modest, Lieutenant. What are the titles? The first book was called The Art of the Eye, the Heart and the Mind, a study of German cinema of the 20s. And the second one was called 24 Frame Da Vinci. It's a subtextual film criticism study of the work of German director G.W. Pabst. Turns out he's not a great spy as he botches the mission, but that's the point. Sie sind so Deutsch wie dieser Scotch. It's more important that he understands cinema than spycraft because that's where the real battle is being fought. This is a running theme in the movie. The Germans love to use cinema as a tool of propaganda, and that adoration of the medium leaves them vulnerable to penetration. Film culture is like the exhaust port on the Nazi Death Star. 
During the screening, Marcel, Shoshana's lover and projectionist, lights a pile of 35mm film on fire and starts a conflagration that consumes the cinema. The Nazi High Command is destroyed in a theater by a fire started by film. It's almost too on the nose. One could interpret this to say it's cinema that killed the Nazis. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only, killing Nazis. We can really see the cinema as war comparison when Shoshana kills Zoller in the projection room. Zoller, in Nation's Pride, snipes his enemies from above in a bell tower, but in the cinema, it's inverted. This time, he's still up high in the projection booth, separated from the battle below, but he's the victim. His heroism on the field of battle is undermined and taken away in the context of the theater. In this version of World War II, it's not tanks, snipers, or bombers that end the war. Instead, it's a cinema owner, some Jewish guerrilla soldiers, and a film that destroys the Nazi machine. It's no coincidence that a director with a profound love of cinema ends his movie about cinema with this iconic quote. You want something you bitch? I think this just might be my masterpiece. This isn't just Rain talking about his ability to carve up Nazis, but Tarantino using the lieutenant as a mouthpiece to say that this movie is his own masterpiece, his own testament to the power of cinema. Tarantino even said in an interview, all that happens in Inglorious Bastards is because of the cinema, and it's not a metaphor. The 35 millimeter cinema killed the Third Reich. I'm not ashamed to say that this idea was one of the best moments of my life as an author. Now, obviously, Bastards is an alternate history. Hitler didn't really get gunned down in a theater, but that speaks to the broader point. Cinema didn't storm Normandy, but it won the war in people's minds and kept it won. During and after the war, cinema served to cement anti-Nazism as the norm for American culture, a culture which was widely exported around the globe. Nazis have remained a symbol of evil in many movies, ranging from Sly Stallone soccer movies to Indiana Jones' Adventures in the Desert to Captain America punching Hitler in the face. Tarantino suggests that 35mm film and the medium of cinema in general is the cultural safeguard that killed the echoes of Nazism and kept them dead. But was he right? Over the past few years, we've seen a rise in xenophobic neo-fascist political groups. The Golden Dawn in Greece, the Alternative for Germany Party, and white nationalists in the USA. The degree to which these groups can be likened to Hitler's Nazis varies, but the shared DNA is pretty easy to spot. There's also been a rise in anti-Semitic and racist violence and Nazi-esque content on the internet. With all of this happening and growing every day, it's safe to say that maybe Tarantino's theory that 35mm cinema killed Nazism for good doesn't hold up. So what happened? Why isn't cinema enough anymore? Well, to answer that, let's first discuss why cinema ever worked in the first place. It's clear from the film that Tarantino is primarily concerned with the power of movies writ large and the act of going to the theater. It's a communal activity shared with many people, all of whom are experiencing the same thing you are. This especially matters because it turns watching movies into a ritual. Ritual doesn't mean goat sacrificing or pentagrams necessarily. It simply means a set of activities that distinguish one moment from the mundane time surrounding it. Paying for a ticket, finding your seat, and watching the movie all amount to an experience of ritual that makes the movie itself more resonant because, as psychologists have argued, ritualizing activities lends them a greater air of importance. For Tarantino, this is most true in the experience of film in particular. He shoots all of his movies on film, argued against having his movies digitally projected, and only shows film at the theater he owns in Los Angeles. The added ritual elements of film, the sound of the projector, the changing of the reels, the need for a projectionist, all serve to supercharge the ritual elements of the theater. That power enables the stories we tell on film to have a lasting impact among communities. Strong enough, the film asserts, to keep the Third Reich dead. Unfortunately, that's no longer how it goes. You can stay abreast of every major movie release without ever leaving your bed. There's no built-in ritual to engaging with movies on your laptop. This not only means movies no longer resonate like they used to, but that people have the ability to curate their own cultural experience in a way that is hyper-tailored to their interests. With the disillusion of cinema's poignancy comes the loss of its powers. The source of all this is pretty clear. It's the internet, dummy. But to understand exactly how it happened, we'll have to turn to a scholar who'd been speculating about the internet before it was even a twinkly network of tubes in Al Gore's eye, media theorist Marshall McLuhan. 
In his final work, The Global Village, he referred to the future information superhighway as global media networking. One offshoot of this new development, as he predicted it, was the death of monoculture, or in other words, everyone doing their own thing. This setup of everyone choosing culture a la carte to fit their interests is a symptom of what McLuhan called robotism. Robotism, or right hemisphere thinking, is a capacity to be a conscious presence in many places at once. McLuhan saw technology as pushing humanity toward a confrontation with two different ways of thought. Left hemisphere thinking, which is associated with hierarchical reasoning and visual space, and right hemisphere thinking, which is associated with more primitive intuitions and acoustic space. For McLuhan, the Western world has been dominated by left hemisphere thinking, but technology is pushing us toward right hemisphere thinking, or robotism. The left hemisphere assumes shared culture and rules. One example of this is the shared ideal that Nazis are bad and maybe should get scalped. On the other hand, there's the right brain thinking that rejects these shared ideas and has everyone coming up with their own systems of belief and behavior. Now, the actual neuroscience of this is spotty at best, as recently scientists have poked holes in the idea of left and right brain thinking. But his identification of the hidden effects of technology remains prescient. We're losing shared culture every day. Sure, there's a few vestiges of monoculture, like Game of Thrones and the Avengers, but mostly people are free to consume their own highly personalized suggestion algorithm. This arrangement is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the splintering of society leaves a space for all kinds of cool things, like a YouTube channel that analyzes philosophy and culture. At the same time, it also leaves room for behavior that we socially agreed is bad to blossom, like Nazism. McLuhan explains this as a result of the loss of a ruling center. Robotism is also decentralizing, he writes. Culture becomes organized like an electric circuit, each point in the net as central as the next. Electronic man loses touch with the concept of a ruling center, as well as the social restraints based on interconnection. Hierarchies constantly dissolve and reform. By ruling center, McLuhan means the set of beliefs we all share to make sure society works. We all agree that it's good to be nice and bad to, I don't know, kill Jews for their ancestry, but that system only holds because we all think it makes sense. As that shared agreement becomes weaker, the nastiness it holds back can come to the fore. This is what McLuhan means when he compares society to an electrical circuit. In a circuit, each point contributes to the whole rather than there being a central source. You can reorganize the circuit at any point. The same is true for our culture now. There's no fixed ethical center, so you might get your ethics from Facebook, Twitter, something awful, 4chan, Snapchat, YouTube, or any other digital hellhole. That source can be different for anyone, and as such, prevents us all from agreeing to a set of rules and behaviors. That brings us back to Tarantino's ideas about cinema. At the end of the day, the reason 35mm film killed the Nazis is by virtue of an appeal to that ruling center. Cinema was a defining force of culture and brought with it narratives and ideals. Now, this isn't always good, i.e. Riefenstahl and the Nazis, but for the most part, movies serve to cement the ideas that define society. Where once cinema was able to relay these critical social messages, now that we're all suffering from a severe case of robotism, not so much. So with this cultural acceleration well underway and all of us seeing and feeling the effects of robotism, what does that mean for our good buddy Quentin? After all, this is the man who shoots all of his movies on film and even resisted letting them be digitally screened. He's a ferocious defender of the theater experience and the history of film, yet his thesis on the power of cinema seems no longer relevant. So what's an auteur to do? Well, step one is adapt, and against all odds, we can see Tarantino doing exactly that. He just released his latest film, The Hateful Eight, as a four-part miniseries on Netflix. Just a few years ago, this would have been unthinkable for him. Yet, here we are. Even Tarantino is seeing the future and making choices to keep his voice a part of the culture going forward. But he's not all the way done with the past either. His next and allegedly second to last film is set in 1969, a time when cinema was inarguably a central cultural ritual of America. It raises the question if Tarantino's love of the past and disdain for the future will play a part in that story. Will it just be nostalgia for a time Tarantino better understood? Is it just an inroad to an unlimited buffet of film references? 
Or will he acknowledge that maybe film isn't as powerful as he thought it would be and show us a different perspective on cinema, one that accounts for the changes he didn't see coming? Either way, we can't wait to see how Tarantino's latest work fits into our ever-fracturing world.